Good afternoon. You're all very warmly welcome to this event here at the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, the event is co-hosted by the Royal Irish Academy, by the University of Notre Dame, and by the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute at Queen's University, Belfast, and forms part of the ARINS project, analyzing and researching Ireland North and South, which the Royal Irish Academy and Notre Dame have been so valuably pioneering in recent times. This is one of a series of conversations that have been co-organized by the Mitchell Institute at Queen's. I'm the director, my name is Richard English, uh, by the Mitchell Institute, by the Academy, and by Notre Dame. We've hosted events here in Dublin, in Belfast, and in London. And the aim behind this series of conversations on Britishness and Irishness, conversations on Britishness and Irishness, is to offer an opportunity for public, respectful dialogue and discussion of these questions which are so vital on this island and across these islands. And you're all very welcome this afternoon. It's a great pleasure also for me to introduce our distinguished panelists this lunchtime. Sam McBride is the Northern Ireland editor of the Belfast Telegraph and the Sunday Independent, writes on Northern Ireland also for The Economist, and was previously the political editor of the Belfast newsletter. His acclaimed book, Burned, the inside story of the Cash for Ash scandal and Northern Ireland's secretive new elite was published in 2019. Uh, a very, very well-received book and a widely, uh, widely sold and widely read account of something which was very important in the, the history and politics of Northern Ireland. And Sam McBride is somebody who is a frequent and I think very important commentator on politics and current affairs in Northern Ireland. Wallace Thompson was a founding member of the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, in 1971. He is a former Northern Ireland office civil servant, a former DUP special advisor, a respected figure in the independent Orange Order, and someone for whom religious faith and political commitment are both particularly profound. Would you please, for a wonderful session on the conversations in Britishness and Irishness, join me in warmly welcoming Wallace Thompson and Sam McBride. Thank you, thank you, Richard, and thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you to the Royal Irish Academy for the, for the invitation to be here today. I, as a journalist, have interviewed Wallace Thompson several times over, I'm not sure, 10, 15 years, and I always enjoy interviewing Wallace Thompson. And as a journalist, you don't always enjoy interviewing um, everyone who you're asked to go and speak to. Um, the, 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 the principal reason, I suppose, that I enjoy speaking to Wallace Thompson is not because I agree with him, there's plenty that he says that I don't agree with, uh, but because he's honest. And as someone who has spent most of my career as a political journalist, that's not the word, unfortunately, that always defines the people to whom I'm asked to speak. Um, and so it makes what he says much more interesting because I believe that what he is saying is what he genuinely believes. He's not trying to push a particular um, line. He's not trying to change our minds in a particular direction. He's trying to genuinely articulate what he thinks. And that, I think it's fair to say, has got him into trouble on various occasions. He has been quite controversial um, in various directions. He's probably annoyed everybody, I think, in, in uh, northern politics in his time um, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a prominent figure um, over the last couple of decades or so since he left the civil service. Um, but Wallace, let's, let's start with who you are for people here who don't know you um, and where you come from. Richard has given us a very podded background of who you are, but it would be very easy for people to perhaps mischaracterise you. You're a founding member of the DUP, you're a Paisleyite, um, you're a member of the Independent Orange Lodge of Ireland, and for people who maybe don't know the intricacies of the loyal orders, that's basically a type of Orangeism that thinks that the, that the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland is a bit liberal, a bit suspect, so slightly more traditional, um, I think it's fair to say, um, slightly more hardline, more emphasis on religious faith, um, but you're the person who in recent weeks has spoken out to say that you're open to Irish unity um, and that has created all sorts of reaction which we'll come on to later. But tell me, tell me about who you are, where you grew up and the sort of Northern Ireland into which you were born. Right, thank you Sam. Well, it is a, a privilege to be here with you this, this afternoon and to openly talk about these matters. Um, yeah, I was born in Balamoney in North Antrim in 1953, so I'm 70. 
and as the years pass, it makes you think more about your own mortality and the future that you're going to leave behind for your, for your family. Uh, I was born and reared in a Church of Ireland family. Uh, we were Protestants. Uh, I grew up conscious of the fact that I was a Protestant and that there were Roman Catholics, but it didn't seem in the 60s, 50s and 60s, it didn't really make much difference to life. Life went on happily. And uh, I was aware of, of the Orange Order as well, uh, the main order. Um, my, some of my family members were, were in the Orange Institution. So you kind of grew up in that culture. We had Roman Catholic neighbours and we all got on very well together. Um, but I think when, when I became a, a teenager, it was a period of change in Northern Ireland, the, the late 60s and from 67, 68 on we were uh, facing the, what to us was the trauma, the unexpected trauma, and that's an issue in itself. We didn't see this coming of this civil unrest. And I remember my father saying that this is a very serious matter, the, the, the first civil rights parade in, in, in Derry. Um, the world seemed to have gone upside down. And um, I was of an age then when I, I was conscious politically and I, I was fearful that our beloved Ulster was under attack um, and that all that I held dear was now in, in some danger. And as the years passed from the late 60s into the early 70s, that became more and more of, of a concern. So my baptism really in, in, in sort of political life came around that period where I felt that my heritage, my faith, my traditions, my very existence were threatened with extinction. And because of that, I turned to Ian Paisley's politics, first of all, and then also to his spiritual perspective on life. And explain to me how you came into contact with Ian Paisley, and explain to me also how politics and faith became entwined yeah. for you. Yeah, well, I became aware of Ian Paisley, I suppose, I say as early as 63, uh, believe it or not, when he was protesting outside my, my local school over some issue or other. Uh, but as the Troubles broke out, 64, you had the Diva Street issue with the tricolour, and then in the Troubles themselves, 68 onwards, I felt that he was giving a voice to how we felt. And um, I began to then, I basically declared myself a Paisley man, because I thought this man at least is saying what we feel, he's expressing our fears, and he's forthright, and he's straight down the middle. The Unionist government was uh, sort of floundering around, it seemed to us. Uh, so I became a follower of Ian Paisley politically, first of all, uh, but as I got to know more about the man, it was, I was very struck by his own spiritual view, his evangelical, evangelical Protestantism, that I hadn't been that dreadfully familiar with. Or you know, it was something I knew about, but it was out there. Uh, so I became more conscious of Ian Paisley, the, the Christian you may think that's a strange description, uh, bearing in mind why, the way life was then and what was being said, but he was an evangelical preacher, and I came to what I would believe to be a, a, a conversion to, to faith in Christ through, through my contact, indirect contact, with Ian Paisley. And you, you stayed close to Paisley until the end of his life. Yes. Lots of people um, who had been Paisleyites were dismayed when he went into government with Sinn Féin in, in 2007. That was obviously a massive moment in Northern Ireland's history, in his life, in, in, the, in, the, in the future of the Stormont institutions. You decided to back him at that point. Yeah. You went into Stormont as a special advisor to Nigel Dodds, who was, um, who was the deputy minister, then became the finance minister. Uh, explain to me why you did that at that point. You wouldn't have done that in 1971 when you were a founding member of the DUP, I don't think. No. No, and everything, I suppose, Sam, is of its time as well. I mean, there was a, a, a sense in which, by 2007, society had changed so dramatically in Northern Ireland that we had to accept certain things. Uh, and I, I wrestled with the whole concept of uh, entering government with Sinn Féin. I mean, it was a very painful experience for many of us, but I'm glad that the decision was made to do it. I supported what he did, what Ian Paisley did, and the rest of the party and I have no regrets. And that, in many ways, too, was a seminal moment for me. If the early days of the Troubles were pivotal to me, the period of devolution in 2007 was also pivotal in making me think more about where we go as a, as a society. And 
I'm just, I'm just curious about this because pragmatism, which is essentially what you're saying, um, pushed you towards that decision in 2007, was not what the DUP was known for for most of its history. Nope. It was very much a party of, these are our principles and we will stand with them regardless. And um, very much Ian Paisley would have criticised people as compromisers. That was a, that was a very critical term. Uh, what changed in him and in you and in other people in the party as they moved towards this? Well, I think, as I said there a moment ago, I just felt that, that you know every moment in history has its own challenges. Ian Paisley, the day that the Assembly got going in 2007, in May 2007, when Tony Blair and, and all the other dignitaries were there, uh, he, he mentioned uh, from the Book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to build and a time to tear down, a time of war, a time of peace. And I felt that that passage of Scripture was so apt because it seemed to me when we lived through the early days. I mean, there was a documentary done by the BBC on Ian Paisley there earlier this year, um, and I, I had a small part to play in that. And when I saw the video excerpts, you know, the, the, the film, uh, the footage of the, of the early troubles, you were thinking, is this the same planet? I mean, I remember it, but it seemed as if I was looking at it from a totally different angle. And how we said the things that we said, how anyone said the things that they said. So at that moment, that was of then. Um, 2007 was of then. Troubles were largely over. Uh, we, I suppose, from my point of view, it was my, my journey through all of this took a step in a different direction. I felt that the only thing to do then was to work towards a time of peace and cement that. Uh, so it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for any of us. But and we did it. Fast forwarding a few years to 2016, by this stage you're no longer a special advisor in Stormont, you're still a member of the DUP, but you're retired, you're largely not involved in, in those big decisions by the party, but as an individual you backed Brexit, you supported yes. it, as did most people in the DUP. You have some regrets about that now, I think it's fair to say, um, in terms of how it's worked out. Can you maybe talk through how I, you approach it now? Uh, I have regrets about, I think, the whole Brexit scenario has been a a lesson on how things shouldn't really be done. Um, I supported Brexit. I felt that, you know, as a as a nation, the United Kingdom should be able to move on to do its own thing outside the European Union. I had concerns about the growth of the European Union in different areas of life. So I felt, yes, this is the chance now to to leave. And members of my family asked advice as to what to do because they weren't sure and I said oh vote to leave, vote to leave. Uh, but my mother-in-law who's, who's now passed away some years ago who lived in County Fermanagh, it was in her early 90s and she said oh no we couldn't vote for Brexit because what's going to happen to the border? And I thought oh, there'll be no problem with the border, well, that'll be all sorted out, not something to worry about. I live in Dundonald in East Belfast so I'm not going to worry about the border. So her words came back to, to haunt me really later. Um, now I think I think we had a right to vote to leave, but the thing hadn't been thought through. It was the worst example of a referendum, I think, that ever we've seen anywhere in the world. Uh, so while I would probably vote to leave, I would think it through more carefully. And if I was more aware, if I had been more aware then of what I know now, I might have had a lot more thinking to do before I decided how to vote. It's gone belly up and we know that. Um, and. Uh, we can blame the Brexiteers, we can blame our own attitudes within unionism, we can blame the European Union, we can point the finger in all directions, but the reality is it just, it just has ended badly and it's changed things quite dramatically from my own personal perspective as well as to how we move forward. We just develop that a little bit. In 2019, Boris Johnson betrays the DUP after having been to the DUP conference. I was there. He was roared to the rafters. Uh, he promised he would never allow an Irish sea border. He then recanted on that um, very, very um, starkly and um, with very little decorum. You said at that time that it was enough to make you question the value of the union. And I remember being shocked by that statement coming from a founding member of the DUP. Uh, w would you be sitting here today thinking, talking about the possibility of Irish unity if Brexit hadn't happened? Probably not, no, no. I think that's a very fair question. Um, I, I think that that, to me, was a significant <coughs> moment. Um, now I've mentioned several significant moments in my own journey um, and life experiences, but the way in which we were treated by Boris Johnson was, was quite frankly disgusting. Um, and. Uh, I suppose it built on a pattern of what we saw as betrayal. 
by mainly conservative politicians. And if you go right back to Edward Carson, I can't think of the exact quote, but he mean basically said he had no confidence in any of them, that they would sell us down the river. That's been unionism's problem, uh, that the ones that you thought should be your friends very turn, often turn out to be your worst enemies. Uh, Boris had to get over a problem. He thought, I'll sort this out tonight and sure I'll, I'll get it all reversed tomorrow. Um, I think that's probably what he did think, uh, but it has, left, it has left us now constitutionally in a new position. Uh, it's a fallout from Brexit that has made me think more deeply. Uh, and the, the irony is, I mean, I'm still strongly in favour of maintaining the union, but I am open to looking at other options. This has to be done in a very, a very respectful way and over a long period of time. But those who are telling me at home in Ulster that you know, we must stand firm uh, against all attempts to make us think of our future, we must maintain the union, are the very ones who are then also saying that the union has been fractured by Brexit. Uh, and that Article 6 of the Act of Union has in suspension and so forth and so on. So on one hand we're, we're being told that to talk of even thinking of a new future for the island is heresy and blasphemy. Uh, we must stand firm for the Union and yet they're telling us the Union is, is broken. Uh, and I haven't yet heard anyone who's in a position to say we can repair that break. You said in 2021, a couple of years after Boris Johnson did what he did, you said the Protestants who'd fought at the Somme were fighting for an empire which is gone, for a nation which was essentially Protestant in its essence, which is gone, and against absorption into an Irish Catholic state, which is gone. Much of what our forefathers were fighting for or against is gone. Yeah. Can we talk me through how you think things have changed in terms of how you think about um, Northern Ireland's place on this island and in the Union? Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, th th those things that I referred to there were all, I thought, symbolic uh, examples of significant change. Um, our forefathers did fight against what they saw as Rome rule. Uh, as an evangelical Protestant, um, I can understand how they felt that way. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, Sam, I mean, or as maybe you've mentioned by our introductory remarks, uh, that by Richard, that uh, I'm driven by my faith, and that is primarily what does drive me. Uh, my unionism is important, but my Protestantism is more important. And our, fa our fathers, my, most of my uh, mothers and fathers' generation signed the Ulster Covenant. It was because of the fear that an absorption into some home rule arrangement was going to be Rome rule. That is, that is now completely changed. Um, the empire has gone. We were talking earlier about the Commonwealth and so on, a different animal entirely. The empire is gone. Our forefathers, including my great uncle who fought in the, the first war and died, were fighting for the empire uh, without any hesitation. They left their homes and went and fought and died for that empire. It is gone. Uh, the whole dynamic has changed. Uh, we live in a secular United Kingdom. The Republic is now a much more secular society. That in itself throws up challenges for me because I, I, I have to recognise that in that context of a, a secular mindset across these islands, my views are very much minority views and might be seen by some as anachronistic to the point of being absurd. But I would still hold to strong moral ethical views based on what I believe to be Bible truth. My concern would be that whatever arrangements are made constitutionally in the future, either within the UK or in some All-Ireland arrangement, that what I hold dear would be preserved, protected and recognised. Uh, but it's a long-winded way of saying that we're in a totally different environment now from 100 years ago. And you've talked there about your family, um, you've talked about the, the deep sense of history that there is within unionism, which is also true in nationalism. There are very long memories on this island as to what happened hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Yesterday was the anniversary of a more recent event of the murder by the IRA of Edgar Graham, a young law lecturer and unionist politician at Queen's University. You lived with Edgar um, for a while at university, you knew him. How significant in the mindset of Northern Unionists is the memory of IRA violence in how they approach thinking about a United Ireland? I think it's very significant. Um, and I, I lost Edgar, who was my, one of my closest friends, on that December morning 40 years ago when he was gunned down as he went to the law faculty at Queen's University. 
uh, I was shocked to the core by what happened. Visited his grave there in the summer and stood at it, thinking that's 40 years that fella has been lying down there. He could have been made, making a massive contribution to academic life, to political life. Um, he's one of the what ifs. Edgar is an example that we've mentioned. My wife's cousin was blown up. Uh, three RUC men were blown up in Fermanagh in 1976. Um, but there are many other folk in Northern Ireland who have suffered far more than that, who have lost many members of their families, are looking for answers to questions and looking for justice. And it's deep within the psyche of the Unionist people. It goes back to what I think I said to you in the interview in, in the summer, that the, the, the sort of the siege mentality of Protestantism is something that's not easy to understand unless you're inside it. As a people, we've always felt our backs to be against the wall. We're always being attacked. What comes across, perhaps, to other people as triumphalism and arrogance actually is a fearfulness and insecurity uh, and we use the example of Derry and the siege of Derry and the iconic nature of that when our forefathers fled from different parts of the, the country and in behind the walls and starved and died and shouted no surrender that's that comes again from from a sense of insecurity um, and so the troubles, the troubles have left an indelible mark. But I think in fairness, it has to be said, you know, that nationalists would feel something similar as well. Because if you look at any of the, the atrocities that we would refer to, Edgar's murder was dreadful, but there were Catholics and nationalist academics also murdered. Um, and there are other uh, uh, terrible atrocities, such as the Kingsmill Massacre of 1976, I think it was, um, where 10 Protestant workmen were taken out of their minibus and, and gone down. Uh, a dreadful thing, but before that and around it there had been sectarian attacks, sectarian attacks on Catholic homes where brothers had been killed in their houses. So I think as a unionist I have to say look, let's look at this collectively because we're all hurting. Now my, my, my fellow unionists may say oh, but most of, the, most of the attacks that have been done have been done by Republicans on, on loyalists but there was a, a two-way process and if we are going to go forward in a mature basis we have to recognise that a lot of people have suffered an awful lot of hurt in Northern Ireland, and we can't allow it to trap us moving forward. I've, I've been blessed with, with 10 wonderful grandchildren. I'm unbiased, but they're wonderful grandchildren, and I'm thinking more and more of their future. And to them, and even to my own children, the troubles are largely history. The, that generation will not be trapped by the, the trauma of the troubles. Now, I don't want to be little in any way the suffering of folk I mean, it's been appalling and it was unnecessary it should never happen there should never have been any campaign of violence it was totally unnecessary it could have been avoided the mistakes were being made by unionism but they could have been sorted out and the ira campaign was a travesty which has left a dreadful scar because through that campaign then all sides were affected you had loyalist gunmen going out and murdering uh, innocent Roman Catholics, appalling things have happened. Um, that could all have been avoided, but uh, we, we can't be trapped by it. We have to remember them, we have to revere their memory, but we've got to try and move on. About two months ago, I interviewed you for the Belfast Telegraph. Did a big long interview about your life, about what you thought, about Brexit, about all manner of things, but the really significant thing that you said was that you were open to the idea of Irish unity. You actually said that you thought it was probably inevitable, yes. that there was some form of New Ireland. Yes. Do, you wanna, do you wanna maybe clarify yes. for this audience what you think about that? Um, I mean, it was, it was picked up by the New York Times. They said it was a bombshell interview. Um, lots of people read lots of things into that. Um, how representative do you think you were of unionist thinking from a traditional background and what do you now think, having had a couple of months to reflect on it, about uh, what you said? Uh, well, uh, the, the word inevitable or inevitability has come back to haunt me uh, a little bit um, and, and yet as I was, uh, Sam and I were chatting about this beforehand and we were saying I mean, it's, it's inevitable that that certain things are inevitable unless things intervene. For example, it's inevitable that my children won't pass their exams unless they study. But if they study, then there's no inevitability about failure. So inevitable is kind of clarified. I'm attempting to get out of a hole <laughs> by saying that. Uh, uh, Lord Alderdice the other night on The View said that he didn't think that anything was inevitable in life. Um, some things probably are, actually. But he said we were on a trajectory. Uh, uh, and I think his summary of it was pretty much along the lines of my own. I mean, it's painful for me, as a, and you've know, you know from what I've been saying in my background, I'm, I'm a staunchly strong Ulster prod um, with a deep-seated commitment to my religious and political heritage. Um, but I think that 
we, we all have to, right across the spectrum, north and south, for the sake of going forward and bringing something better for the next generations, we've got to be open with each other, honest with each, with each other. Yes, remember our past. We're all, we're all, we're not victims, but we're all the outworkings of our past. You know, people were talking recently about the Cromwellian settlements and the land grabs of the, the Williamite period, and I think, am I to be blamed, you know, for that? Because that's my people, you know, historically. But where do we begin and where do we end with all that? We are Irish people. You down here are, member, are citizens of the Irish Republic. I'm citizen of the United Kingdom. Um, but I do feel that the discussion needs to take place. And in saying to you what I said in the summer, I think that we are... The reality of facts around us, the reality of, 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 of the demographics and everything, as things are changing, uh, it would be foolish not to acknowledge that. All I really want to do is to talk to people, to help, to try to get both sides to understand each other better. And recent, just the other morning, in fact, in Good Morning Ulster, they were talking to school children uh, from Northern Ireland who were doing something at Stormont. Uh, nothing else was really happening there, so at least they're going up to do something. And um, uh, they were saying about the lack of uh, Irish history in some of the schools in our province. And I, I suffer from that as well. I did history at university. But, you know, we need to understand these things, where we've come from, where we're going, faults and all, warts and all, to quote Cromwell. <laughs> what, was, what was the reaction to the interview from unionist friends of yours? I was pleasantly surprised by the number of people who said to me, look, Wallace, you're saying the right thing. Uh, and I got it from where I least expected to get it. There were those who saw me as having softened. Uh, the more extreme views were of another Lundy, and I mean, Lundy was burnt the other day there up in, up in Derry. Uh, so it's not a very nice comparison to, be, to, to have to be made about you. Uh, I, was, I was prepared to accept that. But a surprising number of people right across the board who wouldn't say it publicly, within the loyal orders, and right across the board we're saying look, what you said took courage it has actually brought to the surface certain fundamental realities so i think overall i i was it was reassured reassured i was struck by another element of what you said and while lots of people who are nationalists and are yes. arguing for irish unity who yearn for it who are working for it might be delighted to see somebody who's a Paisleyite swing behind at least the possibility that this could be something that might happen and that you might be able to sign up for. I was struck by the difficulty that that, that that creates for some of them because you don't tick lots of the boxes that some of those people would be comfortable for. You once um, went on uh, Joe Duffy on Liveline here and said that the Pope was the Antichrist and that created a minor diplomatic incident because you were a special advisor in the civil service at the time. I mean, you, you have got a particular worldview yeah. that to some of these people is so foreign that they struggle to reconcile um, your views on those things with the idea that you might actually agree with them on Irish unity. Yeah. Has there been anybody from the likes of Ireland's Future or from any of the groups that are campaigning for this or any of the parties that are campaigning for this, has anybody got in touch with you after that interview and said, you know what, we'd like to sit down and talk about how we could work together in this? Yeah, well, I don't want to sort of, uh, you know, to breach any confidentialities, but there were people who came to me uh, from a fairly wide set spectrum of nationalism after those interviews, the interview with yourself, uh, and some of those I'm definitely following up. Okay. And in fairness to them, they have come back. Um, but uh, this is not something that can be done lightly by me or by anybody. This is, this is something that has to be thought through with great care. I think what you say is right. I mean, there's some people who are willing to look at the idea of a, a new Ireland but they come from the more liberal Protestant tradition. And yet when I think of Ian Paisley, whom I, I remember with great fondness, um, especially in his latter years, and had some wonderful conversations with him and still remain friendly with his family, um, he saw himself as an Irish man. Uh, and, you know, yes, you, you probably think the man was difficult for you to get your heads around back in the early days, some of the things he said, but should we all say things that we then <laughs> regret saying? Um, uh, but I think that if Ian, I mean, Ian Paisley, I think, was, was probably open, I mean, he became quite friendly with Bertie Ahern and others, open to a much broader perspective on, on how, how this island itself moves forward. So I sense that I think, I think what I'm doing is saying that within the evangelical Protestant circles, our faith is vitally important to us. We now recognise that the whole landscape has changed across the UK and Ireland with Brexit and so on. We're looking to see how can we, as a, as a people, 
move forward to the best of our own advantage and future. And one of, one of the most compelling things about history, and we've got a very eminent historian in our midst here in Richard, um, is that people and circumstances can change radically in the course of people's lifetimes, let alone over centuries. And you're essentially saying, if I pick you up correctly, that Ian Paisley, this man who was the uber hardliner of Austrian unionism, the man who deposed essentially every unionist leader who was seen to be too liberal, that he is the person whose principles, whose ideals, whose um, guidance, if you like, if that's not the wrong term for this, has led you into a situation where you're now thinking about the possibility of Irish unity. I mean, that's, that's, that's an extraordinary thing. Well, I wouldn't want to sort of, you know, attribute, attribute too much to any one man, but I mean, as, as you know, I mean, Ian Paisley has been a big, a big uh, factor in my life from when I was a teenager until, until and still is, even though the man's gone nearly 10 years. Um, but Ian Paisley was a non-compromising evangelical Protestant uh, till his dying day. That never changed. And I think I would say I'm in the same position. Um, whether or not it was the wisest thing to do to refer to the Pope in that way back at that time is another matter, uh, given the context. But I haven't softened my spiritual views. I believe strongly in my evangelical Protestant faith. I think Ian Paisley held to that line. He, he, he changed politically, that's, that's clear. In a sense, that has affected me as well, uh, the, the movement that he made. Now, there are people who view it very cynically. I think it was a move made by him for his own personal reasons. But uh, either way, I think what I'm saying here is in that spirit of Ian Paisley, there can be movement politically, there can be movement in a very broad political agenda, but from my personal point of view, I stand on my own Bible values. That would be on marriage, LGBT issues, all the rest of it. I would say I'm very much out of step with much of modern society. But well, that's, that's, so be it. Let me, let me ask you about Irish unity. You're open to discussing it. You're open to thinking about it. You're open to being part of the discussion about how it might work. What are the things that concern you most as a Northern Unionist? You would still vote for the Union tomorrow, you say, if there was a border yes. poll. So you're not sold on the idea, but you're open to it. So what might persuade you and what are, what are you fearful of? Well, I, I, that's a very, a very good question. Uh, I'm fearful, I suppose, of a lack of deeper understanding of what makes the Ulster Protestant tick. Um, it's that thing I referred to earlier, you know, the, 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 our historical experience of being you know, under siege and under, under pressure, uh, and it's been seen as sectarian, and I mean it hasn't been the hundred years of many issues where the government failed, uh, there's no doubt about it, that's another discussion. I, I, I just don't know that nationalism, either north or south, really understands the likes of myself, uh, and maybe I'm wrong on that. I would like to think that I'm doing my best to understand nationalism. I have a, a respect for the nationalist tradition. Uh, and they're within Protestantism. There's always been that streak of, of nationalism, republicanism that runs through the whole, the, the whole, ex, the whole period of, of, of Irish nationalism. Uh, I, I do feel that I have got some understanding of it. But I, maybe I'm wrong in this, and I'd be very, very happy to be wrong, but I, I'm not sure that the, the orange tradition or how it's expressed is is really understood by, by nationalists um, and that would be a concern that I would have going forward that we need to have a real, we, this is a mutual thing, I know it works both ways but we need to sort of try to dig on, get under the skin and see where we're, where, we're, where we're at and what really do people feel about the likes of myself and my people and my tradition. And faith is central to you as you've mm -hmm. said several yeah. times, what concerns you about that? You say that it was a concern obviously of your grandfathers in, um, in 1921 and prior to that. What could reassure you on that front? Well, it's, it's going to take a lot of, of areas to be looked at. Um, you know, the freedom to express a Bible view on public morality in, in the public square, uh, an acceptance by nationalism of the validity of the orange tradition, which is complex because there are many sides of that tradition. I know that, and um, there are elements of it that would concern me greatly. In, in Northern Ireland, I have spoken out against, uh, it's on the record, I've spoken out against you know, clear sectarianism within the Orange tradition, where there have been the most dreadful things done. 
the, the terrible song about uh, Michaela McGarevey that was uh, sung in the Orange Hall in Dundonald was beneath contempt. Um, but the broader principles of Orangeism, I think, you know, I'd want to see those maintained and, and, and protected within any All Ireland arrangement. Uh, but it throws up it throws up all sorts of challenges because what is Orangeism's raison d'être? You know, what is what is it there for if it doesn't have if it doesn't have some control over its own the constitutional destiny of where they're living? Northern Ireland, it seems that people feel they have control because they're still within the union. I don't know. There's lots of questions there. In a couple of minutes, we're going to come to the audience for some questions. So if you've got something, um, get it get it ready. But let me let me just ask you two, two more things yes, about this. Yes, certainly. What about the monarchy? Is that significant? What about flag, anthem, those symbols of um, sovereignty? Are those significant? The monarchy, uh, I can take or leave, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I was slightly reassured as a Protestant when I saw the coronation that the word that, the, that there is still a Protestant monarchy. That kind of gave me a little bit of a feeling that maybe things aren't as bad as I thought they, they were. Uh, I like the Queen and all the rest of it, but I'm not, I'm not an ardent royalist. I mean, I, I could live with it or without it. Um, and uh, so that's a factor, but it's not a major one. Um, the the flag, uh, well, the Union Jack, I suppose, is, is, a, is dear to me. It's part of my upbringing. I, I mean, I was brought up to sort of look at a tricolour and think that's the enemy's flag. Uh, but I don't have the same view of it, you know, and I know what the flag means. It, it, it's it's uh, nationalism and orangeism and peace between them. Now, whether that still can be held as legitimately, you know, something that we would accept, that's a flag which I have used that in different interviews to say, like, that's, what, that's what we're aiming for here. So the tricolour itself, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be overly perturbed one way or the other. But I think we're going to have to get a completely new, uh, starting from a, a blank sheet, and look at all of those things. So while the flag, the British flag, the the, the link with Britain, is a is there's an emotional attachment to it, but it's an attachment to something that doesn't exist anymore. And when I look at orange banners, I see pictures of great men from the past of people fighting battles in, 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 at the Somme or whatever, and you're looking at the aristocratic sort of background and you're looking at different things. But that Britain is gone. You see, this is the thing about it. That's a, that's a parade of the past in terms of what the banners are showing. None of that exists now. Um, so we're, there's a sentimental attraction to, to your heritage, but as your heritage changes, you've got to be realistic to accept that things are changing. What about Ulster Scots? That's pitched into this sometimes, that that's a way to um, <laughs> look after, if you like, northern yes. Protestants and their culture and their identity and whatnot. What's, what's your view of that? Well, I, I uh, have no strong commitment to Ulster Scots. I mean, in my more cynical moments, um, people talk about um, you can do GCSEs and A-levels. That's what they want to introduce uh, in Ulster Scots. I grew up in North Antrim, and I think I'm fairly fluent in it. I regard it, to be perfectly honest, as a, and I mean, I will be condemned for this, but as an accent or a dialect. Uh, I have no difficulty understanding. My granda spoke in a way that to me was just a ball of money accent, but today would be sold as Ulster Scots. Um, Scots Irish was the, the term used at one point, but then became Ulster Scots to make it more localised. There are friends of mine, you know, who, who condemned me roundly for saying that I was an Irish man. Uh, they, they would be of the view that the Ulster Scots tradition is crucial to them. Um, and I don't take away from the fact, I mean, we're not very far away from Scotland geographically, and you look out over the, on a clear day over the coast, you'll see Scotland. Scottish history has impinged upon us tremendously um, in terms of religion and politics. Uh, so there is a link, there's a heritage there, but I think sometimes it's over-marketed and um, over-emphasized, and certainly the language bit of it, to, to, to say that there's an equality between the Irish language, which is a language, and the Ulster Scots, which to me, I don't think is a language, there shouldn't be any parity between those two. And I think that one's been used to kind of as a counterbalance against the other. So yes, while I, there are certain aspects of it that appeal to me, I do feel as well, just going to say this, that to, 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 to the Ulster Protestant community, as they have moved away more and more from their religious principles and have embraced sort of more of a more secular agenda, they're clinging hold of the Ulster Scots as a sort of a substitute for their Protestantism, and that's not, to me, is not a good thing. Thank you. Have we, have we any questions in the audience? If you just raise your hand, and I've been asked to just make clear that, there is, that this is being filmed, so you will be on a film um, somewhere. <laughs> yes, gentleman down here. 
I have a question, thank you. Conor O'Malley is my name. I'm in the Irish Association, but it's just, in a personal capacity, I'm asking this question. In, in Ireland or in the South, you are all citizens. You're in a republic. But in the UK, you are a subject of the, the UK. Does that, and of course it relates to issues of titles of honour, and of course titles of honour are prohibited in the Irish Constitution, but they're very much, of course, integral in, within the British system. What do you think of those differences? Well, I never thought of those before. I mean, I, I, I see myself, I suppose, as a citizen of the United Kingdom. Uh, I've never, and, I, and a subject of His Majesty the King. Um, but th then down here it is, it's a republic, so therefore it's a different sort of mindset. But it's not something that I've ever given any thought to, to be perfectly honest with you, Connor. Not one way or the other. Uh, it's an interesting point. Uh, and it would be one of the things to be thrown into the, to the melting pot when any discussions take place. But I just see myself as a British citizen, an Ulster man, uh, and a Protestant, and a British citizen, probably in that order. <laughs> Maybe not, not or Protestant, Ulster, and then British citizenship. That would be a thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, gentlemen here. Uh, you, you, can, you can decide between yourselves which of, it, which of you it is. There were two don't, of you don't there. fall out over it now. Thanks very much. Uh, well, it's Jim O'Callaghan. Yes, Jim. You're very welcome, Dan. Good to meet you again. Uh, first of all, I'd say to you, in terms of the use of the word inevitable, a good answer for you will be that, in my opinion, nothing in politics is inevitable. Yes. So, and I think things have to be worked for. I can understand why um, unionist politicians are hesitant about getting into a conversation about Irish unity, because once they do, uh, not only are they going to face criticism, but they probably believe they're on a trajectory to something that's going to eliminate their political uh, identity. Also, however, in, in the South, there is hesitancy about speaking about it. Even parties who are very strong about advocating it don't talk about it that much because it involves compromise. What can be done to encourage, I suppose, the broader unionist community to engage on this issue? And what do you think sort of non-policymakers or ordinary people in the South could do to get engaged on the issue more. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, the, the, the first problem you have is that many unionists won't want to speak about it because they just don't want to speak about it because they don't think it's an issue. Uh, and to begin to talk about it then leaves them open to accusations of compromise or weakness or whatever it might be. Um, I, I faced that simply because I've suggested talking about it. Um, so for that body of people, I'm not quite sure what way you get around that other than to reach out the hand of friendship towards them and say, look, you've no ulterior motive in doing so. I, I do feel that, that there's still an awful lot of bridges to be built between down here and Northern Ireland, right across the board. In fact, the Northern Ireland, unionists and nationalists, there's a bit of a divide now over the, over the hundred years of partition. Um, but there are those who are Protestants who are evangelicals, and I, I know them well because that's where I, the sort of circles I move in, who would probably value and appreciate people down here right across the board reaching out to them saying, look, what are your concerns? What are your priorities? How do you feel the future is for you? Can we talk? And I think talking and discussing and, 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 and engagement as much as we can do it, because if there is going to be a border poll at some point, we don't want another Brexit. We need to be really thinking this thing through now um, and being honest with each other, you know, being totally open and honest, as I've sought to be in all that I've said and done, and it hasn't always been easy. But while we don't fully understand the issues that you face, I think it's a two-way process. So I would just value inter, you know, individual contacts and organisational contacts, the parties down here, maybe reaching out even beyond the parties in the north, but reaching out to interest groups like Orangeism um, and, and uh, the churches and so on would be very, very helpful. And there's a gentleman just behind Jim, and then there was a lady, I think, over here, if I've remembered correctly. My, my name's uh, Hugh Logue. 2017, the European Council unanimously agreed that if Ireland uh, were to come together, uh, unite even, uh, that they would be readmitted without uh, a problem, seamlessly, I think there was the word used, into uh, the European Union. Mm -hmm. You, Sam, then interviewed a member, Robert Ramsey at the time, and he said, well, 
I'd look at, he was Brian Faulkner's uh, uh, private secretary, uh, and the last, uh, Brian Faulkner being the last Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. He said, if I was getting back into Europe, I would certainly look uh, at that. Uh, there has been some thought, uh, Wallace, that there's a, a, a group called, not a group, but a, an identity of European Unionists, uh, and many of them are uh, believed now to be the people who are moving towards the Alliance Party, uh, people who voted anti-Brexit but uh, haven't had their way, and they see uh, integration with Ireland perhaps bringing them back uh, into Europe. Uh, you've postulated this debate on Irishness, Britishness. Is there a European factor there? There is, Hugh. Um, I'm tempted to say sitting for an instance chair. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, leaving the Ulster Scots aside, the, the, that, that's a complicating factor without any doubt. Uh, uh, and the outcome of Brexit has just unsettled people generally and has drawn new lines. I think a lot of nationalist folk in the North who were happy enough with the Belfast Agreement mm -hmm. and they were content to remain as European citizens and British citizens and things looked as if that's the way it was going to remain. That has changed and a lot of nationalist people were saying that we've, been, we've lost our European identity here um, and there will be unionists who feel the same. So those, there are new fault lines being drawn and you've raised a very interesting point. Uh, how we deal with that I don't know. Um, and you know, in a new Ireland, yeah, it would probably be back in the EU. How would I feel about that? I don't know. Um, you know, but those are stresses and strains that weren't there before Brexit, which have those stresses and strains, along with other stresses and strains since Brexit, have made me think more deeply about where we go, uh, because it's not as simple as it was pre 2016. Yeah, and there's someone back here. Yeah, the lady here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. I've got two questions. I should say that I grew up at about the same time as you, 15 miles to the west, in a Presbyterian right, family. Right. We used to go visit people in Ballymoney. Oh, um, the, the first question is a short one, and it's about 2013. It strikes me that the DUP changed its stance in 2013 and that power sharing that had started again in 2007 um, didn't work so well from 13 to 17. Could you say something about that? And the bigger question, if I can just ask, is about the diversity within Northern Protestantism, Unionism, and so on. And the more you talk, the more you're bringing that out. Yes. And that, it seems to me, is what people in the South, where I now live, don't understand at all. Yeah, that's a very, those are very interesting points, uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, um, I'm not here, obviously, on behalf of the DUP at all. I'm here purely in a personal capacity. I'm not sure what would have happened in those sort of later years. But I think the chemistry that there was between Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, sadly, that was a tremendous thing. I saw that at first hand, uh, and I'm glad I did, because it was a wonderfully genuine warmth between the two of them. It opened up doors then for the rest of us to sort of broaden our contact with people we never would have spoken to before. And that, again, was a very big part of my experience. I think when Ian and Martin left the scene, there were great gaps left unfilled. Um, and it began, a number of, number of issues emerged, you know, the, the language issues, Irish language issues and different things, and a lack of, just a lack of of the respect that there was in those, that earlier period, it began to, to become to unravel and fall apart. There were faults on all sides there. So as I say, I think it just because personalities changed, issues came along that caused lack of mutual respect. Um, but you mentioned then the second thing you mentioned about the variety of views within unionism and Protestantism, that's a crucial point. I mean, we talk about united we stand, divided we fall. It was one of the old shibboleths of the of the of the, um, the, the the Ulster Unionists over the years, and Ian Paisley challenged it to me. He used it later on, but he challenged it in the early days, saying that we have got to stand firm for our beliefs, and unity is not the most important thing. It's being faithful to our principles. So the unity card uh, among unionism is brought out a lot. It's been brought out again now to try to circle the wagons in terms of electoral success or failure. But there's a wide variety of views within unionism. Uh, even within DUP, 
Some people feel we should go back to Stormont, some people feel we shouldn't go back. Some people would settle for certain movement on the European issue of the, of the border in the Irish Sea. Others who want root and branch reversal of those things. Uh, there are unionists who are European in their mindset, might want to look at that. Uh, secular unionism is growing. Paramilitaries haven't left the stage and they're a, they're a malevolent influence and have been for so long. They're still there, creating their, their uh, pursuing their agendas. So there's so many, and I think that we all unionism needs to recognise that it's a diverse uh, body within it, um, and also others looking at unionism need to be aware of all of those sensitivities, and that there's no great unionist. People talk about a unionist party, but I, I said at the time this has been talked about some years ago. When they keep every election, the position becomes more difficult. It becomes less secure for unionism, and they're all oh, the unionist unit, the unionist unit, they'll solve the problem. I said it was a comfort blanket, they make you feel cosy, but it wasn't going to solve any problem. It's not unity we need, it's an honest acceptance of our changing circumstances, and also an acceptance that within unionism there are many voices, and that's how, how, we, how we deal with those. There's, yes, a gentleman just to your left there. Oh. Uh, Thank you. Um, the, the, the UK's union is in a lot of uh, trouble, uncertainty, uh, and perhaps it's fragmenting. And uh, whatever government takes power after the next election will have a lot of trouble bringing it together again socially, economically, but also politically. How important is that factor, would you say, for Northern Ireland unionists? What weight would you give to, to the, the weakening union in the UK as a whole? Uh, I think that's a very significant development. The UK is weakening, its economy is weak uh, and getting weaker, I think. And also, I mean, we speak of the strong economy that we're associated with in Northern Ireland, but that, that's changing and the economy down here is growing. Uh, the fragmentation of the, of the union potentially is another thing. I mean, Scotland, who knows uh, what might happen there? That will change the whole um, the balance as well. So. Uh, <laughs> I think that all of those dynamics are, are, are part and parcel of, of, of what we're looking. I mean, people will, will ultimately think, where, where, where is my uh, best hope of a, a happy financial you know, uh, position that I can put bread on the table and butter that bread and live and give my family what they need? People will be dictated to. That will be dictating what, how people feel. But um, there's a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty at the minute throughout the economies of both Ireland and, and the UK. If we another question, just another couple. Yeah, lady here. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is fascinating. Um, my name's Jude Weber. Um, I've got two quick questions. One is, what do you think unionism has to do to appeal to particularly a younger cohort of, vo of voters who are voting alliance to, to remain relevant, basically? And, and allied to that, given the shutdown of Stormont, and I think the quite real prospect that it's not going to get solved before Christmas, before the new year, anytime soon. What kind of lasting damage is this DUP blockade doing to the cause of remaining in, in the UK, do you think? Thank well, you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to take your, your second point first, if I may, um, I personally think it's doing damage. Uh, I have made that clear to the party. Uh, at the time of the Windsor framework, I, I said I felt we should go back and try and deal with the issues uh, from the Assembly or through the Assembly. That's not the view held by all within the DUP, as we know. But to me, at a very simple level, uh, unionism has left itself as, a, as an observer and a bystander where it could be a participant. Yes, the demographics are changing. Unionism is no longer going to be in control in Stormont. But if I, I mean, as a unionist, to me, why, why hand away one of the, the main weapons that you have, which is a local assembly? Robert McCartney, if I'm quoting him correctly, said that uh, he's a former politician in Northern Ireland, said that the only card unionists had left was to stay out of the assembly. Well, if that's the only card we've left, well then, to, to use the Dow's Army metaphor, we're, we're doomed, really, to be honest. Uh, I think that we need to be back in and back in soon and accept the reality of a Sinn Féin First Minister, work with all of that, 
show responsibility fiscally and economically, be prepared to take the hard decisions. That goes across the board, not only for the DUP and the unionist parties, but be in there seeking to control something. I mean, I remember 85 in the anglo irish Agreement, unionism, we were bystanders. So much of the period from 72 on, we were standing helplessly thinking, this is dreadful, this is dreadful, this is dreadful. We couldn't do a thing. Now we've left ourselves in a position where we are really the same. So we need to get back and get back as soon as we can. Your first point then about young folk, yes, there's a challenge there, all right, because I know that talking to the younger generation of my children and so on, the border issue and all the things we're talking here about constitutionally, they don't really, they don't really think too much about that. It's not the first thing in their heads. They're thinking more in terms of social, economic, uh, broader issues. Uh, I'm not sure what unionism does. I mean, uh, if unionism holds to its, for example, the sort of principles I have on terms of morality, we're going to lose some young folk because they take a different view in life. Um, but young people aren't, they aren't led by constitutional issues. They don't really think much about them. So if unionism wants to attract them, perhaps unionism has to focus more on social and economic, but that has been, that has been tried by the Ulster Unionists and others who have tried to focus on that more sort of secular, broader base, and it hasn't so far yielded much result. I mean, I know, I know a lot of young folk in our churches who wouldn't agree with Alliance on uh, moral issues, who would have difficulty with them on marriage and things like that, but they vote Alliance because they think Alliance are much more forward-looking in terms of how we live together on this island. And I think a lot of young folk are saying the sort of things I've been trying to say, that we've got to be realistic and, and move forward. That generation, I think, will be the ones who will take it forward. I'll not, probably not see it, but you know, I'd just like to think that that would be how things would move. Eventually, when we move away from the period that we've gone through with the troubles, people will think differently, and, and uh, our young folk will be the custodians of that. We've got time for just one more question. Um, there's, there's a lady in the red at the very back there looks very enthusiastic. Thank you very much. <clears throat> my name is Blohin Gallagher. Um, and I'm sorry I was a little late because my train was late. So I, if you cover this, my apologies. But given that there will be a border poll at some stage, and the only people who have the criteria for there's the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. what's your, in your opinion, what's the worst outcome that could happen? And what could we do now to mitigate such an outcome? Yes, the, the border poll is much talked about by Sinn Féin and others, um, and there's a certain inevitability, if I can use that word, uh, about it happening at some point. There are those who think it happened around 2030. Uh, at the minute, I don't think it will happen, although from a unionist perspective, they, I mean, the recent opinion polls down here have indicated that there would be still a substantial majority in Northern Ireland for remaining within the union. I, I do think that would be what would happen. Uh, so in a, in, from a unionist perspective, to get it done sooner might help uh, to solidify the union and then thus remove the debate for several years on, on, on Irish unity. Um, but when it does come, uh, we all need to be prepared for it. It comes back to the Brexit thing again. This is where now, here in the end of 2023, get into a new year, we need to be thinking this through within our own communities. How would we prepare for a border poll? It would have to be well thought through and people need to know what they're voting for. You know, uh, we didn't half know what we were voting for with Brexit. We need to know the nuts and bolts of it. So if it is 2030, it happens. And there are those who think that would be when it would happen. We've got six years, you know, to, to, to that's not that long, um, to, 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 re, to talk. All of this process that I'm talking about here might be part of that, you know, the building blocks in preparation for, for, a, for a, a border poll. Um, uh, and then bad, the bad outcome, I suppose, would be a very narrow majority in favour of u unity. You, you have the, the threat, and I haven't touched on this today at all, but there's a really, there's a still a threat of violence from loyalists. And I, I mean, this is one of the things I was going to touch on, but I kind of forgot about it, but I mentioned the paramilitaries. But we need to understand, you know, that we can sit here and talk in this, these wonderful surroundings and talk reasonably, but there are people not that far from where I live who would not talk or think reasonably. And they're saying, they're still saying no surrender. Um, uh, and there are many of them have a very determined attitude. We will not have Home rule. We will not have Irish unity. We will not have any of this. And um, 
it's a reality that has to be faced up to by all of us. You know, that it's not going to just be a, a walk in the park, but well, we haven't any direct control over how people respond, but the more people we prepare for it in the right way, the less there maybe will be the risk of that happening. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you especially for your candour. Um, and let me just ask you one final question before I hand over here. What brought you here today? You didn't have to come here today. Um, you'll get a lot of grief for some of the things that you've said here today um, when some of the people that have been friends for very many years um, listen to what you've said today. Uh, and what is the single thing that you would want a Southern audience to know um, about people like you? That we're genuine, that we aren't motivated by sectarianism or bigotry or hatred of anyone, uh, that we have a genuine love for our province of Ulster, uh, our Northern Ireland, we have a genuine love for our British heritage, but we have a genuine, I think, love as well for the people of this island. Uh, and that's, I'm only speaking for myself, but I, I would feel that that's where I'm at. Uh, I, I'm committed still to <coughs> unionist cause. Uh, people will say, well, how can you be when you're saying some of the things you're saying? But that's because we have to be realistic and look at where we're going. But I think all of us need to sit down and respect each other. I, yes, I came. I was invited down here, and I appreciate the invitation. I came because I thought it would be a, an opportunity just to meet folk and also to, to maybe develop some of the things that we'd said in the interview that we'd done in the summer. Um, I will get some grief, but I think that I also will get a degree of, of, of support and understanding. So my conscience is clear. I uh, you know if I'm appearing in the papers and my conscience is clear, I can live with it. Uh, but so that's, that's it. So I would encourage everyone to reach out to each other right across the board. And uh, we're all, yes, we're all the outworkings of our history, but we're not, we, we're not to be, we can't be trapped. We can't be trapped. We have well, to thank forward. you. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you to the audience. Thank you. A lot of the time with painful and divisive issues, one of the problems we face is we don't have an opportunity for open, respectful, candid disagreement in a reasonable way. I think today we've had a real privilege in hearing and having an opportunity to listen to that kind of discussion. Thank you to the Royal Irish Academy and Notre Dame for setting up these wonderful conversations. Thank you to all of you for coming and for the great questions. Um, there will be lunch for all of you to which you're all welcome to carry on the conversation informally. But for a wonderful discussion, for great and honest and candid and sincere reflections and for fabulous questions from our chair, please join me in thanking Sam McBride and Wallace Thompson. Thank you.